It's Hungary in the 60s, and a man is being interrogated by police officers about the passing of a woman. The scene shows, back in time, as this man follows his girlfriend along a bridge, over a river. He asks her if she will move in with him, and she coldly replies that it's over. She doesn't want to. He is taken aback and asks why it's over, and she said it's because she only said yes before, because she felt sorry for him. She walks off with little concern about his reaction. In response, he stands in one spot, stunned, and then follows her downhill after her becoming angry as she walks along the river. He yells out to her asking if she was with him. She replies nonchalantly that it doesn't matter, but when she turns around, he brings a blunt weapon to her forehead. He shots her. He then brings the police to the scene of the crime, and reenacts what he did to the woman while her body was lying on the ground. He reveals that he had an intimate moment with her. A lady present, pretends to be the deceased woman while he recounts what he did by showing police where he touched her and what he did to her while she was lifeless. His sister is present, and another older lady tells her to not believe it. In the court trial, the defense lawyer requests for witnesses to be called again as there are contradictions in their stories of the time. They said they spotted the man in the area where the woman was eliminated. The judge tells both lawyers not to waste his time, and the judgment is handed down as guilty. He is sentenced to hanging. In jail, the man is having a shower with the other inmates when a bigger man comes over to him and slaps him hard across the face provoking him to attack and telling him to defend himself. The man leers at him saying it's way easier fighting a woman. Then another man comes over to him with a handle of a broom and sodomizes the man with the broomstick causing the man to scream out in pain. Soon another inmate comes into the shower block and tells them to stop. The man is put into another cell, and he looks at his hand as droplets of blood fall onto it from his bloody nose caused by being slapped. The man is then before a tribunal, and they announce that because of no prior convictions, his hanging sentence will be changed to life imprisonment, but he says to his mother that he would rather be deceased. Next, we see a back of a man sitting and watching TV. He is watching a man slap a woman, and he is becoming sexually aroused by the woman getting hit, and he proceeds to touch himself. A woman is walking up a lonely road at night and a man on his bike rides up to her side. They both say hello, and the young woman asks for a ride, and he says sure. While she is on the back of his bike, he feels up her leg to which the woman is receptive as if she knows this man. They stop in a secluded area, and they begin making out. The man is quite aggressive with undressing her, but the woman seems to like it as she is smiling at him. He pushes her back into a pile of hay, but then the woman is telling him to stop, and that what he is doing is hurting her. He does not stop or slow down, and she becomes frightened. He then strangles her with his hand, and continues to get intimate with her. After she is deceased, he turns her over and undresses the rest of her clothes. He dumps her somewhere. The coroner is looking at the corpse, and cannot seem to see any brutal injuries so decides that the woman took her own life. Just as he decides this, one of the detectives asks him why she would do it while she is nude, but the coroner does not reply. There is a shoe factory, and a new young lady is starting her first shift. She is quiet and reserved and the senior colleague who happens to be the sister of the man put in jail shows her around and where she will be stationed. A male worker walks past and makes a lewd comment to her, and the senior colleague tells him to shut up. After her first shift on the job, it is dark. She asks if she can go with her older female colleague to which the woman says not today, but then changes her mind because the young woman looks so nervous. She drives with her colleague for a while and then she walks the rest of the way towards her home along a railway track. A man is following her, and hiding so when she turns around, she cannot see him. She turns around a few times and when she turns around again, the man clops her over the head knocking her unconscious. While unconscious, the man rips her clothes off and touches her sexually then he leaves her laying on her back over one side of the railway track. She wakes up just before a train approaches. A detective visits her in the hospital to ask her questions, but she is still unconscious. Her lady colleague comes in with flowers, and then goes to walk out when she sees the detective, but the detective encourages her to come in stating that he has finished. She walks in crying, and sits beside the young woman, and touches her arm with immense pity and sympathy for her. The detective asks the colleague if she knew of any boyfriend, or ex-boyfriend or enemy but the woman says no. Later on in the night, the detective is still beside her bed talking to her asking her to open her eyes and tell him who hurt her. Meanwhile, the man that hurt her is hiding outside the window looking in. Suddenly, the woman coughs and opens her eyes, and the detective becomes excited telling her to stay awake, but she falls asleep after making eye contact with the detective. He then runs to the hospital hallway and yells loudly for a doctor. Just as a doctor comes in, he slaps the woman hard on the face to wake her up which works. There are several people who come to her bedside as the detective questions her but she is not very helpful as she did not see much. All she could identify was that he was strong-boned and wore a black beret. Later the detectives follow two men in a field on motorbikes. When one of them sees the police car pull up behind him he goes to get back on his back and then takes off. The police chase him until he finally gets off his bike and runs, but he gets caught. The detectives interview him and he reveals he left the young woman and was no longer in a relationship. So the detective asks him why he ran 
and the man says that it was because they had been poaching and the fish they had weren't legal. One of the detectives angrily tell him not to joke around, but he reaffirms that's why he ran. A lady in a coat with short cropped red hair is seen walking alone around the university grounds late at night. She looks around several times as she thinks someone is near her. When she walks past some of the university buildings, her shoe buckles underneath her and a man that had been following her hides behind a hedge. She walks on further into the dark trees when suddenly the man comes at her with a small axe. She lifts her arm back, grabs the axe, and hits him back under the arm. She screams and screams to get someone's attention. The man runs away from her and two men emerge from the university buildings and run after him but can't catch him. The man runs on and enters his house where his young boy is. He kisses his son on the head and tells him to sit down for tea and asks where his mother is. His son tells him that she went out for some air. He finds out that his wife was attacked and goes to the hospital with his son. He talks to some detectives and then it dawns on him that she has been wearing a wig and red shoes and that he attacked his own wife. He stands by her bed and then later when they are home, his wife lays in bed cuddling him and tells him she got the man good and the detective said she did well. Her husband said it was because of her wig that softened the blow. And then the wife explains why she was wearing it for him, so that she looked different for him to spruce up their love life as he had not touched her for months. Her husband just asks if she can put on the wig, but she said it got blood on it and it was taken in for evidence. Then the actual strangler killer visits the man in jail to psychologically play mind games with him. He says since they used to work together, and he heard he doesn't get many visitors he thought he would visit him. The man in jail is weary of this man but then the man tells him his wife was attacked last week, and he knows he didn't do it. This seems to gain the man's trust. Meanwhile, the new lead detective gets angry at the detectives on the case because the bone marrow results for one of the victims are missing and says they are incompetent. He then goes to the river where the second woman was found and dives down and finds the belt she was strangled with. He says that one man harmed all the women and the other detective says that it's a serial killer case in their town. The lead detective asks for the case files of the old ready case that led to a conviction of a man he doesn't think was guilty but was the work of the now active serial killer. The lead detective goes to talk to the detective. He is leading in the new investigations and questions his team on the thoroughness of the conviction of the man that is now in jail saying that they didn't question all the witnesses and he suggests that there are holes in his story. The other detective becomes defensive saying that he confessed to the crime. He throws his pool stick in anger and frustration with the realization that they could have the wrong man in jail. The young lead detective is denied access to the ready case files from 1950. He walks off and smokes disappointed. Meanwhile, the incarcerated man's sister visits him and he tells her he has filed an appeal. The stranger killer is at work near a train station in his truck when he hears a knock on his door, and it is a young girl who knows his name. She asks Mr. Bognar if he can give her a lift home, because her bike chain broke. He says of course and lets her in. On the drive to her place, he keeps looking at her and her body. The young girl tells him that they have gone too far and he needs to turn around but he won't stop. She then being screaming and panicking asking him why he won't turn around. She then tries to open the door to get out but he grabs her quickly before she can. He takes her to a secluded area under a bridge beside a river. He strangles her until she is deceased then has sexual intercourse with her. Later, he drives off. Meanwhile, the incarcerated man is having flashbacks of the beatings while he is in jail and the torture and can't sleep. He sits up and pricks his wrist with a needle he kept from the sewing workshop he was in, in jail, and blood spurts out of his artery. He curls back into bed and later another inmate finds him and bangs on the door to alert the guards. Then Mr. Balger carries the young girl and dumps her in the river. In the morning she is found, and the parents cry over her deceased body and the detective tells the others to take them away. The young lead detective digs deeper into the old Reddy case, and things start to add up after visiting the scene of Reddy's attempt to pass away, and at the foot of his bed is a rejected appeal motion. The young lead detective becomes angry at the other detectives who are older and worked at the 1958 murder because they hid the fact that Reddy had tried to appeal his case three times, the actions of an innocent man. The young lead detective secretly listens into the detective he has been working with, and his senior is fighting about not being thorough enough with the 1958 murder as they are starting to doubt that they put the right man in jail. The senior detective then requests a private one-on-one -on -one meeting with the incarcerated man to ask him why he said he was guilty if he was innocent. At first, he don't speak, but the senior detective warns him that this is his final chance to clear his record and get an appeal hearing and he will need to tell the truth. After smoking, he explains. He says that he loved Erzabit who was the first lady to be targeted, and she was dumped in the river. He was jealous because he knew a driver fancied her. He then hit her and was so mad that he wanted to her to pass away, that he sprayed a peach with pesticide but then washed it off twice and took it to her open window as a peace offering. Then when he found out the next day that she passed away, he thought he really caused her to pass away, but was confused when he had washed it off twice. The senior detective butts in and says that she was hit with an axe, and the incarcerated man explains that he was not told that until days afterward, and by that time he was consumed with guilt and got mixed up in his head. 
The realization dawns on the senior detective, and he says, I see. The incarcerated man then explains that his wife had left with his son at the time, and he was living alone. He knew he had no alibi so he lied about sleeping at his mother's place. The senior detective stands up and then says that had he caused immeasurable damage and that if he had believed in his own innocence or the senior detective then he would have definitely caught the responsible person and it is his fault the other two women passed away. He stands up and puts his face close to the incarcerated man and tells him he will have to bear the last few years. The incarcerated man asks why the senior detective said he would help him and the senior detective storms out of the room telling him that he will have to bear it. The young lead detective has a tactical meeting with the other detectives to show them that the woman that was thought to take her own life was actually eliminated. He reveals that she has passed away in the same way as all the other women, dumped in the river. He builds a profile of the serial killer. The district constable is angry with all of their incompetence, and warns if they do not catch the serial killer by any method necessary, they will all be fired. The incarcerated man's sister is working late at the shoe factory when she gets a visit from one of the detectives who fancies her. He makes out with her and starts to get intimate with her, but then she leaves saying it will never work. She walks off into the night and Mr. Bulger watches her leave smiling. He drives on a few hundred meters where he gets out of his truck, and a lady who knows him says hello. She says that the bus is late to take her home. Mr. Bulger offers to take her home. She says yes. While they drive along, she asks about Nora his wife to which he says she is still terrified, and then she says Nora is welcome to come over one night. He just smiles and nods. He takes her to a secluded area, strangles her, and then has gets intimate with her. He then dumps her into the river. The detectives start scraping the top of the bridge for evidence of the vehicle that the serial killer used to dump the previous victim. And the young lead detective asks for all the routes of all the drivers of the shoe factory. Mr. Bulger comes home after eliminating the woman from the factory and gets intimate with his wife Nora. In the morning, he goes to hug his wife but she is very disturbed. He asks her what is wrong and she says she had a nightmare and a bad headache. He says he will be back tonight. Then she walks over in distress away from her son and cries as she realizes it is her husband who is the serial killer. She knows that he attacked her the other night because he didn't recognize her with her short wig and red shoes. When Mr. Bulger gets to work at the shoe factory, he sees the detective searching through one of the trucks. He hides in part of the warehouse and then walks to the main factory. All the staff is lined up outside while the police are inside. He asks one of the workers what is happening. And he tells that the police are questioning all staff, especially the drivers. Mr. Bulger starts to get nervous. He is called in for questioning, but says that he knows nothing about the girl. He says that. He only knows that she was his wife's classmate at school. The detective says he has to wait. And Mr. Bulger says he has animals to feed. He asks if he is being charged. The detective says no. And Mr. Bulger smiles and walks out. The detective is feeling defeated until he hears a strange noise. It's the sound of Mr. Bulger's shoes making a crinkling sound like one of the witnesses they questioned many days ago. He then knows it is him. He follows him out of the factory, and his colleague the young lead detective pulls up on the other side to block his way. He hops out of the police car and tells him he is under arrest. Mr. Bulger runs from them. He ducks and dives and hides in buildings while they chase him. They then catch him out in a field standing at a cliff, and they run up to him. He jumps into the water. The senior detective looks at the young lead detective and tell him to let him die. But then the young lead detective asks about Reddy. He dives in after Mr. Bulger and looks around for him until he finds him unconscious at the bottom of the river. He drags him back up to the surface. After becoming conscious again, they question Mr. Bulger saying that he took Erzabeth's life too. Mr. Bulger just smiles and says that they are a bit late. The young lead detective continues to question him to understand his motive. He says that he had a lover called Erzabeth, but she got bored that nothing happened between them. He watched her and her boyfriend have an argument. He caught up with her and started talking. They then went to have an intimate moment beside the river. He says that she lifted her skirt up and sat on him but he could not get an erection, so he asked to see her body, and still nothing. She then laughed at him, went to grab her stuff and go. He got so angry that he grabbed a metal piece from the railway track, and hit her in the head with it, and only then he became aroused and could have intimacy with her unresponsive. The lead detective asks him why does he do it, and Mr. Bulger says that he will never work it out and that there are some things they cannot come close to. 